Ja, herzlich willkommen zur zweiten Ausgabe des Wörterbuchs der Gegenwart, die unter dem Thema Das Forum läuft. Ich werde jetzt eine kurze Einführung machen, dann wird Eyal Weizmann sprechen, danach Dipesh Chakrabarti und dann werden wir hier ein gemeinsames Gespräch haben und am Ende haben Sie auch die Möglichkeit, noch Fragen zu stellen, zu kommentieren. Was bedeutet Politik und wie kann sie gestaltet werden? Etwa wenn der Klimawandel Bauern oder Nomaden bedroht, die von der Erde leben, die sie bewohnen. Insbesondere wenn sie sich noch zudem mit nationalstaatlichen Regierungen auseinandersetzen müssen, die ganz eigene Wasserpolitiken verfolgen. Oder wenn indigene Gesellschaften im Regenwald des Amazonas um ihre Lebensgrundlagen fürchten, weil der Nationalstaat und internationale Firmen Interessen an der Ausbeutung der Ressourcen haben. Und sich dabei gleichzeitig die Weltgesellschaft und die Dezimierung der Biodiversität und der letzten großflächigen Grüngebiete des Planeten sorgt. Die Parameter des Politischen haben sich in den letzten Jahrzehnten dramatisch verändert. Auf der einen Seite beobachten wir eine Skalierung der Problemlagen. Lokale Konflikte sind auf Ängste verknüpft mit regionalen und globalen Entwicklungen. Darüber hinaus verschieben sich die Machtasymmetrien permanent. Die nationalstaatliche Ebene wird oft weder lokalen Interessenskonflikten gerecht, noch scheint sie aufgrund international agierender Firmen und Finanzakteuren geeignet, die Makroprobleme in den Griff zu bekommen. Begleitet werden diese Machtasymmetrien von Wissensdifferenzen. Aufgrund immer komplexerer Wissensarchitekturen und Technologien werden die Problemlage immer weniger durchschaubar. Expertenwissen löst Alltagswissen ab, dient aber oft selbst, als Macht und Interessens, um Macht- und Interessenskonflikte zu kamuflieren. Somit wird der Bereich des Politischen ein Beispiel für die tiefen Transformationsprozesse unserer Zeit, die neue konzeptionelle Antworten verlangen, weil die alten Kategorien nicht mehr taugen. Es ist die Zielsetzung des Wörterbuchs der Gegenwart, genau diese Veränderungsprozesse zu adressieren. Dabei werden bewusst Begriffe ausgewählt, die eine Verwendung in unserer Alltagspraxis haben, deren Grundbedeutung also nicht nur von Fachdisziplinen definiert wird. Dem unterliegt die Einsicht, dass wir, um ein neues gemeinsames Verständnis unserer Realität zu erzeugen, jenseits des Wissens der Fachdisziplinen ansetzen müssen, um der disziplinären Segmentierung der Wissensbereiche und der Ausgrenzung der sogenannten Nicht-Experten zu entgehen. Also was tun im Hinblick auf den Begriff des Politischen? In einer ähnlich komplexen Situation in der Mitte des 20. Jahrhunderts, nach dem faschistischen Terror und im Angesicht eines möglichen internationalen Atomkriegs, hat Hannah Arendt vorgeschlagen, den Begriff des Politischen unter Rückgriff auf die griechische Polis zu bestimmen. Im Zentrum der Polis auf dem Marktplatz zu Hannah Arendt treffen sich die freien Bürger, um in Rede und Gegenrede über die Geschicke der Stadt zu verhandeln. Im freien Austausch aller möglichen Perspektiven liegt der eigentliche Sinn des Politischen und der Ort, wo sich dieser manifestiert, ist die Agora, später bei den Römern das Forum. Dieses Verständnis von Politik setzt allerdings zwei Dinge voraus. Erstens eine ständige Gesellschaftsstruktur, in der die griechischen Bürger durch die Sklavenarbeit von ihren Alltagssorgen weitgehend befreit sind. Die Unfreiheit der Sklaven bedingt also in der griechischen Polis erst die Freiheit der Bürger, die notwendig ist für die Praktizierung der freien Rede im Forum. Zweitens betrifft das griechische Politikverständnis nur den Ort innerhalb der Polis. Das Forum ist also dort ein geschlossener Raum. Seine Außenbeziehungen unterliegen nicht der Sphäre der Politik, sondern nach außen herrscht in diesem antiken Konzept des Forums im Grunde ein latenter und offener Kriegszustand. 
List und Tücke sind in der Auseinandersetzung mit anderen Gesellschaften oder Stadtstaaten erlaubt, geradezu gefordert. Möchte man also das griechische Verständnis der Polis, wie Hannah Arendt es entwickelt, auf unsere Zeit übertragen, ist man mit verschiedenen Herausforderungen konfrontiert. Da unser Bezugspunkt nicht mehr der Ständestaat ist, ist die Freiheit der Bürger nicht mehr durch die Unfreiheit der Sklaven bedingt. Sie muss über demokratische Aushandlungsprozesse erst hergestellt werden. Politik ist damit immer auch eine Techne, die das Forum erzeugt. Um die Freiheit der Beteiligten zu gewährleisten, ist eine reflexive Praxis erforderlich, in der bestehende Asymmetrien, die die Vielfalt der Meinungen einschränken könnten, permanent mitgedacht werden. Das Forum muss dabei so gebaut werden, dass Perspektiven, die durch die Mechanismen des Forums selbst ausgegrenzt werden, dennoch in das Forum hineingetragen werden können. Hannah Arendts Bestimmung des Politischen als die Berücksichtigung aller möglichen Perspektiven wird dabei zu einem handlungsleitenden Prinzip bei der Erstellung des Forums. Unsere heutigen gesellschaftlichen Probleme sind nicht mehr auf kleine politische Einheiten wie die Polis begrenzbar. Sie entfalten sich, wie bereits erwähnt, in einem Konflikt lokaler, regionaler, nationalstaatlicher und globaler Problemlagen. Es gibt nicht mehr einen Außenraum, der durch den Kriegszustand zu definieren ist. Das Politische muss vorgegebene gesellschaftliche Einheiten transzendieren können. Das heißt, Foren sind je nach Problemlagen zu konstituieren. Wir konnten für den heutigen Abend zwei Redner gewinnen, die sich den Fragen nach dem Politischen, den Charakter des Forums aus zwei Perspektiven annähern. Dipesh Chakrabarti spricht aus der Perspektive des Kulturphilosophen. Als Theoretiker adressiert er die Makroprobleme, die sich durch den Klimawandel die planetarische Dimension menschlichen Handelns ergeben. Eyal Weizmann nimmt dagegen die Perspektive des politischen Aktivisten ein, der dieselben Problemlagen aus mikropolitischen Auseinandersetzungen heraus in Angriff nimmt. Herzlich willkommen, Dipesh Chakrabarti und Eyal Weizmann. I know, no, uh, both of them don't need really an introduction here, but I make a short one. Uh, Eyal Weizmann is an architect, professor of visual cultures and director of the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths, University of London. Since uh, 2011, he also directs the research agency Forensic Ar Architecture, a re research agency based at Goldsmiths. The agency provides evidence for international prosecution teams, political organizations, NGOs, and the United Nations in various processes worldwide. A team of architects, scholars, filmmakers, designers, lawyers, scientists undertake research that gathers and presents spatial analysis in legal and political forums. Additionally, the agency undertakes examinations of the history and present status of forensic practices and articulating notions of public truth. Eyal has worked with a variety of NGOs worldwide. He lectured, curated, and organized exhibitions and conferences in many institutions all over the globe, including forensics at the Haus der Kultur in der Welt. Deepesh Chakrabarti is professor in history at the University of Chicago and an eminent theorist in post-colonial studies. He is a founding member of the editorial collective of Subaltern Studies, a founding editor of post-colonial studies, and has served on the editorial boards of the American Historical Review and Public Culture. In his works, he has challenged the concept of a Eurocentric historicism from a post-colonial and subaltern studies perspective. In his acclaimed book, Provincializing Europe, Postcolonial Thought and Historical Difference, he entangles limitations of Western notions of modernity, culture, class, and homogeneous capitalist and democratic developments in non-Western countries. Most recently, his research focused on anthropocenic climate change 
and its implications for historical and political thinking. Within his approach, he questions the limits of our very human-centered view on justice and thus on the politic as well, which become even more significant in the Anthropocene. Welcome again, both of you, and Eyal is going to start. We start, so to say, with a micro-analysis. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, every time I'm here, it feels like coming back home. Uh, and in particular, because I'm going to speak today about a project that really had uh, its starting point uh, very much here uh, at the center, uh, at the, at the Hakave with the exhibition Forensis. Um, the exhibition, as Bernd was saying, was presenting the work of forensic architecture, an agency which deal with investigation of state violence. And in fact, uh, what I'll try to uh, discuss today is a kind of a spectrum um, of work between the kind of uh, eruptive, instantaneous violence, such as destruction, such as shooting or um, uh, murder investigation that, that we're doing uh, often, and another manifestation of violence, and that is the slow and incremental violence of environmental transformation. Now, is there a relation between that kind of eruptive violence and the slow violence of the environment? Um, I hope to show that, that, that these are connected, and I hope to show how to undertake research that operates across scales and across various durations. Uh, so the various durations of this lecture would cover, or you know, we will speak about events and processes that are millennia old, uh, and we would speak about eruptive incidents. And I think something in, in that kind of short-circuiting and recomposition of time is, is one of the tasks of thinking today in, in the context of uh, the Anthropocene, which is um, very much one of the uh, engagement, the intellectual engagement of, of this uh, center. Um, so I, the problem is really that when one does research um, that, that really undertakes an investigation of violence on its multiple scales and durations, that the forum in which such violence can be debated, whether it's a political or juridical, doesn't really exist. So the kind of epistemology that would make that case uh, does not have a place to be heard. And with that, I want to return um, to a short comment, picking up from Burns' uh, uh, statement on, um, on, on the, uh, the concept of forensis, which was the, uh, the name of our exhibition here. So forensis simply is a Latin term which means that which pertains to the forum. Uh, but the great Roman orators, uh, such as Quintilian and Cicero, did not think of forensis as referring uh, only to the domain of the law, as we understand it today. The forum was the space of publicity and circulation, of economy, of politics, and also of law. But there are two problems. The first is that the forum, as uh, conceived in that sense, pre-exists all forms of interaction that take place within it. These are just played out within the forum as if the forum was a stage that uh, would remain the same uh, throughout uh, the performance that happened uh, within it. Um, a neutral stage in a sense that the terms of engagement, the protocol and behavior are all predetermined by the genre itself. Furthermore, and this is another problem with forensics, is that the word started a long process of telescoping uh, throughout its modernization. Um, finally, and I will not describe that process, landing in the way we understand forensics today, which is the, the application of science in legal context. So something is missing. Something terribly important is missing. First of all, is the public and political aspect of forensics. Uh, which was apparent at the beginning, but now is lost into the domain of expertise. And the other one is that the form itself is something that is malleable, something that is defined and constituted by the performance that happens uh, within it. And really that is the difference between uh, state forensics and what we define in forensic architecture as counter-forensics. 
Uh, because forensics right now is the action of the state. This is how the state polices, surveys um, the population under its control. But counter forensics is the way in which those population would return the gaze and would actually um, take account of state violence. But when you deal with state violence, the kind of forums that you can perform that claim uh, are, do not uh, exist, they do not pre exist. Um, so, of course, if you uh, commit a crime, let's say, within a, within a frame of a nation state, there are the laws. Uh, the other courts, everything is, is, uh, is already pre-established. In situations of uh, colonial violence, for example, that very law, that very court that you would like perhaps to appeal to uh, is in itself an instrument of repression, of dispossession, of violence. The law, as defined by colonial states, is actually mobilized against the people uh, that it supposedly uh, protects. So what do you do? Uh, I think that uh, in many other places, uh, for example, forensic architecture, we almost all our work are in frontier zones where um, there is no law effectively or the jurisdiction is unclear, it's overlapping or uh, it's disintegrated. In that sense, we need to think of the forum as something that is assembled around the evidence, right? So the, the forum actually comes as a response to the evidence. First comes the evidence, then the forum uh, might emerge around it. A simple example to that is the emergence of the ICTY, that is the International Criminal Tribunal or the International Tribunal for former Yugoslavia. And uh, in fact, something that came into being after the discovery of the massacre in Srebrenica. So initially you have the evidence, then the forum gathers uh, around it. Of course, now the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is built as an international court, a, a predefined forum into which claims could be made, in which the protocol and, and, and the ideas, everything is already uh, predetermined. So forensics really is forensics where there is no law. Um, and I think that what we need to understand is the co-constitutive relation between the evidence, that is the way you compose it. The evidence is never simply uh, one bit, one object that you can extract from a historical situation, but the way that you create a kind of an assemblage of, uh, that, that, that compose itself into uh, a matter of fact that you would present and the forum that emerges together with the composition of that evidence. Eh? Nothing, none of those two categories pre-exist the other. So the idea that I'd like to introduce here is that we need to turn the forum from a noun to a verb instead of a static definition of a forum, or in fact, a static definition of a public, to regard the forum as a practice, something that must be assembled. Forensics is fundamentally about making an assembling forum, perhaps captured by um, the, the term to end forum. So the problem of the forum becomes complicated the minute that the research that we need to undertake is composed by multiple factors and on multiple scales. So if this is a bit abstract, I would now uh, unpack uh, a kind of analysis that we had to undertake uh, of a situation, the sad story really of, uh, if I can have the slide please, of the, uh, of the Bedouins in uh, Al Nakab in the Negev, in uh, the south of Palestine, uh, who have been displaced uh, and removed for the past uh, 60 odd years uh, since the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, here captured by, by an aerial image uh, by the photographer Fazal Sheikh, uh, the village of Bir Hajjaj, who has been completely uh, evicted. And what you see are simply the traces uh, of its Bedouin occupants. Now to understand that situation, we need to understand it on multiple scales. We need to understand both 
the, the laws, we need to understand the event that led to its eviction, we need to understand the, the story of the climate in which that story, uh, in fact, unfolds. At the center of the struggle for Bedouin rights in Palestine uh, right now is uh, perhaps that village, um, the village of Al-Araqib. Um, and in fact, in that image, almost the entire story could be captured. First of all, we see here uh, an old cemetery, a cemetery that uh, has been in use since 1914, uh, which has remained after uh, the majority of the Bedouin population within uh, the area that came uh, under Israeli control were evicted. And it became an anchor for an act of return and acts of eviction. Right now, 96 acts of destruction of that village and 97 acts of return. Return and eviction. In fact, the Bedouins are the only Palestinians that exercise the right of return physically on the ground. So here uh, you see that the, the Bedouin uh, family of the Aturi family has kind of moved inside the cemetery and around them what you see here are plantations of trees uh, that are surrounding them uh, completely. And every year this forest is coming closer and closer and threatens to erase uh, that village. In fact, that destruction is authorized uh, by uh, the law. Uh, they've lost the case, there was been a legal case for it, and the Israeli government has claimed that these people are squatters, uh, that they are nomads. Uh, because they're nomads, they have no property right. And, uh, and, and here in the diary of uh, Salamaturi, uh, you could see those traces of destruction. Together with the community, on the first day of January 2016, together with the al Arakib Council and another anti-colonial organization called Zohot, uh, we took part in conceiving an alternative forum called Ground Truth. We actually placed it uh, over here. Um, we, we chose that day, the first day of 2016, because we knew that whenever you build anything on site, uh, within a few hours it will be destroyed. We did it on New Year's Day because we thought we could gain uh, a few hours um, uh, within it. Now, the conception of that uh, uh, event, ground truth, was part of a conception of a, a, a truth commission. Um, now, when we say truth commission in a situation uh, of ongoing struggle, that could be a bit confusing because we know truth commission to be an institution of transitional justice, uh, the, some, something that helps societies in South America or in South Africa to recover from period of terror and move on uh, to democracy. But in situation of ongoing colonization and conflict, uh, a truth commission is in fact uh, a tactical political act. Now the idea of that Truth Commission uh, was to think together the climatic transformation of the Negev uh, together with the displacement uh, of the Bedouins. To, to, to see if we can tell both the story of the environment and the story uh, of displacement uh, together. And, and the idea was really to, to, to think about climate change not so much as the collateral of history, that is um, sometimes the way that uh, the discussion around climate change and environmental transformations are conceived. Uh, they are the, simply the unintended consequences of attempts to uh, increase trade, production, um, and there's something always unintended about it, but as, as, uh, as political and human rights activists, whenever we hear the term collateral damage or the framing of that argument as collateral damage will become very suspicious. And thinking whether Zionism is, is, a, is a special case of colonial history, in fact conceived of climate change as a project, as an intention. Uh, not, not only local environmental transformation, but in fact a kind of year-on-year -year patterns uh, of the environment. So the task was to read the history of the environment, the history of the, v of the weather, if you like, through instruments that were not meteorological. Throughout the last 
um, the, the kind of meteorological measurement in that area started only in 1931 under the British mandate of Palestine. And we needed to actually write the history of the weather by looking at other things, by looking at documents, by looking at tax receipts, by looking at production, uh, levels of production of wheat and uh, barley, uh, by looking at aerial photographs, by looking at, at literature from the area, and considering all those sources as sensors as environmental sensors that could tell us the long-term history of, uh, of the environment. Here, for example, uh, is our um, levels of production of uh, wheat and barley in that, in that particular area. I don't have time to go into that, but I'll be happy to, to discuss this later. This is a day after uh, the event uh, has been finished, uh, uh, as the Israeli police was coming to destroy that uh, forum that we have conceived, um, uh, we have removed it in order to avoid um, the, and, and be able to, to recycle the material uh, that, um, that, that this structure was made of, and now it is making three different structures uh, on site. Now, there is something uh, very important about the village uh, of Al Arakib that is also unique about it, that connects it to the history of the environment. And this is that Al Arakib sits on one of the most important and some of the most violent borders that cuts through uh, Israel Palestine and through the entire uh, Middle East. And this border, as violent as it is, uh, it is invisible. Unlike the other physical borders that you all know, the walls and fences, etc., uh, that, that cut Palestine apart. Um, Al Arakib is actually existing on a meteorological threshold. It is actually, this is where it is located. And you see that it is located on a line that on a map is shifting from a spectrum of blue, that is a decreasing rain per, per year uh, bands, to uh, the, uh, it kind of flips over to a spectrum uh, of yellows. This, the 200 millimeter rain per annum, has been uh, generally accepted by scientists since Vladimir Koppen has made his uh, climatic class classification in, in 1918 as the threshold of the desert. Uh, the reason that Koppen, a German uh, Russian scientist, uh, defined the 200 millimeter line as the threshold of the desert is because it brings together three factors. Uh, under 200 millimeter rain per year, uh, apparently, according to him, you could not grow wheat on a flat surface. So that limit of the desert brings together not only quantities of rain, but the relationship between water, seed type, and the kind of agricultural technology uh, that was used at the time. Now, what is very important is that this line is also, so this meteorological line is also a certain, has a legal reality. Because anything that is under 200 millimeter, according to Israeli interpretation of uh, the laws that it inherited from the British and Ottomans before it, everything under, everything within the yellow uh, could not have had permanent settlements. Uh, if it cannot have had if it could not cultivate, if you could not cultivate wheat under that line, uh, there could have been no culture. If there could have been no permanent culture, everyone that lives under that 200 millimeter rain per year is by definition of a nomad, and nomads do not possess property right. So effectively, that environmental threshold has become a, the kind of the sharp edge of a legal doctrine. Uh, so it became important to understand the history of that environmental threshold and to look at how uh, Western uh, Orientalist travelers, you know, those uh, kind of spies and, and, and priests and uh, uh, other um, scholars that were going through Palestine throughout the 19th century that Said uh, write about extensively in Orientalism, uh, have all attempted to define that line and all attempted to define it by eye, by eye observation. What is the last line of fields uh, in Palestine? And in fact, the, the various empires that ruled this area 
uh, of the Middle East have not governed beyond that the, 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 the line that they perceived as the line of the desert. Why should them? There was no, apparently no economy within it. So that line became also a political one that has uh, a deep political history. Now, when you want to see and to measure environmental transformation a long time, the threshold of the desert is a very good membrane. It's a very good place to look because it's, uh, the fluctuation of the environment does not manifest itself in, in, in levels of yield. It manifests itself in the line between crop failure and crop success, i.e. between life and death. And, and therefore, it is a very tuned um, threshold to understand the fluctuation of that line uh, and in relation uh, to the history uh, that unfolds uh, along it. Here you would see uh, the, uh, the line that the uh, Italian fascists have built, pushed the desert line well into the northern Sahara uh, when they've colonized northern Libya. Uh, so this, if you would see that in color, that would be green, and you would see how they chase and, in fact, push the Sahara uh, southwards by using all sort of uh, artificial irrigation, and likewise expel the Syrian Bedouins deep, deeper into it. So following, as I, uh, I in, in, in the kind of in the report that we've produced for the Truth Commission, we were following the 200 millimeter line all along its um, ebb and flow line and all along the kind of the, um, uh, the path it takes, almost like an equator, a sort of distorted equator, uh, around the earth and seeing how all along it here in another beautiful image of Fazal Sheikh you would see here an Israeli settlement and um, uh, the Jahalin uh, Bedouins on the other side of the road wherever you would go there would be a kind of a, a line of encounter uh, that in uh, places where uh, plantations of of artificial forest would, would actually operate as mechanisms of, uh, of pushing uh, the Bedouins uh, away and southward. Here you can see it very clearly. Uh, this is a preparation for forest. The only way that you can plant a forest in that part uh, of, uh, of the territory when, when there's little water is you need to build those dams that, that stop the water. Uh, but those, as you can see, are built on a ruin of uh, a Bedouin home, a stone uh, house uh, that we were able to find later in an old uh, Royal Air Force uh, map. But the line is much longer. It is a climatic threshold that stretches continuously for more than 7,500 kilometers along the northern edge of the Sahara over the Great Arabian and Gobi Desert, and in fact running around the world like an equator, as, as I said. So this line has a history. Now, we were, when we were working on that, uh, the previous, uh, one of the previous projects that we were doing um, was a report about drone warfare worldwide. And we were trying to plot drone attacks, Western drone attacks in Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, etc. all those places, Gaza, Libya, wherever they happened, we tried to plot them on meteorological map. And it was almost astounding to see that almost all drone strikes happen along or near the 200 millimeter threshold of the desert. So, but the obvious conclusion is that drone strikes are an attempt to stop desertification. Um, so, but in fact, the, the history of the desert and the history of the airplane got entangled in a different way. Since the 1920s, uh, in, in, a, in a category that uh, Churchill called aerially enforced colonization, those areas beyond the last field were actually policed from the air. This is actually a photograph of an Italian uh, 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 war airplane uh, going across the threshold of the desert. Uh, they were controlling the people there, not through government or uh, policing at all, but through bombing. Uh, and in, in the case of, uh, of Italy, it was through poison gas bombing. And here also, uh, in, the, in the Negev itself, uh, you would see Israeli planes uh, spreading herbicides uh, to destroy those villages of the cultivation of Palestinian villages. So in fact, operating quite literally as agents of desertification. 
Uh, another very quick uh, survey, or I'll go quickly for a very long survey that we've done, is that a collaboration with NASA where we asked them to provide for us a map of plantation. So this is what is called NDVI. Uh, map that, that shows basically vegetation vigor. And uh, what you see here in green has the strongest vegetation. What you see here in red has almost no vegetation uh, whatsoever. This is on one, uh, in one year uh, only. And you can start seeing the politics of plants. You can start seeing plants as a form of archaeology and ask various questions like, why is this line here where it is? This is the border between uh, Israel on this side and Egypt on that side. And in fact, this, is, this shows you that on Isra in the Israeli side, there's more bushes. This is not dense vegetation, but there's more bushes. The fact they are there is that a result of ethnic cleansing. The Bedouins were taken away. The goats are not eating those bushes, and therefore, uh, but in, on the Egyptian side, they are. And therefore, you have that kind of sharp line uh, registering by plants the politics uh, of the region. You can see here also the borders of Gaza. You can see the sharp drop in vegetation vigor as uh, this area is artificially irrigated on the Israeli side. You can see also the border to the West Bank um, as, as, as direct reduction in, uh, in, in vegetation. And there's many other uh, kind of here, these are various Israeli kibbutz and moshav settlements were always existing as kind of green islands uh, within the desert. Uh, we need to understand the Nakba, that is uh, the process that has begun in 1948 of the expulsion of Palestinians from Palestine also as the transformation of the environment and the expulsion from, uh, from particular uh, uh, in environmental conditions. Uh, here, uh, where there was the area most dense in, in Bedouin settlements, and now you see only white dots, which here signify uh, Israeli agrarian settlements, and the Bedouins were expelled beyond the 200 millimeter line into the arid and dry part of the desert. This is how it looks like when a Bedouin uh, community is actually trying to return and build their uh, settlement within an area that is above the 200 millimeter line. You could see here the back and forth, the sort of ruthless logic of the bulldozer as it erased entirely uh, a village uh, in here. Uh, in this image of Fazal Sheikh, you could see um, also the kind of traces of return and expulsion and return and expulsion that continuously occur. These round things are called sires. These are um, uh, animal pens, and uh, the, the, the circular stain on the ground comes from the bodily fluids of the goats, in this case, uh, on the ground. And, um, and you could see that this is now uh, perhaps a uh, few months old. This might be a year old. This might be two years old, three years old. And you see that those people were expelled and returned to the same place. And you start understanding aerial photography as uh, in the desert, let, let me start a, a bit differently. In the desert, the surface of the earth absorbs politics in a much clearer way. It is registering it in a way that in, in, in more um, moist areas would be washed away. The surface of the earth is itself like a photograph, and aerial photography are photographs of photographs. Here, for example, an expulsion and return uh, of, uh, of a Bedouin tribe from the area where Israel denied is producing nuclear weapon, but still expel the people uh, from there on the basis of a radiation threat. Um, uh, now, the problem of the great desert cities, um, this is one of the greatest mysteries uh, in, in Israeli archaeology, Israeli biblical archaeology, is the discovery of a line of cities that are very much deep, about 50 kilometers south of the aridity line, of the 200 millimeter line, that in fact uh, was, were always used by Israeli, both uh, scientists and also ideal, uh, politicians, to manifest the fact that the Arabs who have taken control of, the, uh, of those cities, those cities were built by the Nabataean, then became Roman, then Byzantine, um, 
those cities uh, were evicted more or less a few dozen years after the Muslim occupation of the area as if um, the Arab occupation in itself is a form of climate change, a, a form of desertification, right? Whereas while the, the Byzantines were there, that the line of the desert was 50 kilometers to the south, um, a, a, that, that effect the, in fact the Arab occupation pushed, made the neglect, neglected that area and let it fall uh, back into desert. This allowed the kind of the messianic meteorology of Zionism uh, in its understanding of that the return to Palestine is making the desert bloom. That is, the return to Palestine is itself a kind of climate change, uh, colonialism as climate change. Uh, the return would push the desert further south. So uh, that kind of cultural um, uh, idea would have to be debunked by looking, in fact, at the evidence, by looking at the fact that you have uh, old cultivation in those areas that were undertaken within valleys. These are, uh, in fact, another uh, agricultural experiment undertaken, in fact, by Israeli scientists uh, quite early on, showing that cultivation was possible uh, in the desert. And the fact that they've produced that was by asking the Bedouin tribes in the area to show them how to do it, right? So there's a kind of a paradox uh, in this claim. I will not um, uh, discuss the kind of the long duration, but uh, in, in various stalactite um, uh, evidence that were cut from, uh, from caves in the area, uh, you could see the fluctuation of, of rain, and you can see that, in fact, during that period of the uh, Arab occupation, there has been uh, a great shift in, uh, in the in natural shift in the aridity line. Uh, going uh, to the north. One of the great uh, resources that were used by uh, the Israeli court to deny, Pal to deny Palestinian Bedouins their right to the land was uh, that Orientalist text by Henry Palmer, uh, who is writing uh, very clearly uh, uh, to call, he, re he refers to the Bedouin as a son of the desert, is a misnomer. Half the desert owes its existence to him and many fertile plains from which he has been dri he's driven its useful industrious habitat become in his hand like the South Country. Again, the idea of the Bedouin being an agent of desertification. Um, without, without going too much into it, uh, one of the things we had to do was to travel with that book in hand. Now, Said has already made fun of Henry Palmer and showed the kind of the racist and, and all, all, all sort of um, uh, cultural misconception that are there, but also his text is a great resource to understand something else. We need not only dismiss the text, but read it very carefully for what it does show. Uh, and in fact, by looking and, and working with this text, finding the hills that he is referring to, the bends in the rivers, etc., uh, one can start reconstructing uh, the fact that um, although he writes that he's seen nobody there, the year that he traveled there uh, was actually a drought year. And, um, and for us to start finding the same uh, uh, elements, that were described and to show uh, that the area, the same area that was described could look very different. This is uh, two days ago um, uh, when I was there in, in Al Arakib with, uh, with, with the community together and kind of showing and documenting uh, the way even uh, wheat uh, is, is, is growing well into what is uh, conceived uh, as a desert. Uh, another very important set of documents came out of um, military uh, uh, documents that we had to read against their own logic. Um, there has been, uh, in the First World War, a great battle on those very hills. This is where the cemetery is, and you see here in, in, in red, you see the British forces. In green, you'd see here the Ottomans. And one thing that was very important was that the British were actually uh, giving the soldiers, for the first time, not maps of where to charge, but actually photographs. And in order for them to orient themselves, they were putting objects at the foreground of the photographs. And here you would see uh, an element that we have found to be 
a Bedouin waterhole, uh, and in fact confirming the presence of Bedouins there during 1918, again reading that document uh, against what it is meant to show. Of course, Google Earth uh, collaborate here with the Israeli government, does not add there's no documentation, there are no names, although the Bedouin communities insist and ask to be included on the maps, uh, on international maps, not, never mind the Israeli maps, uh, they're not there. This allows the government to say uh, they have not been here, that they are squatters, and, and now started together with the community uh, a kind of um, uh, a way of documenting and bringing uh, those villages into the map. Uh, by a process that is, that is referred to as ground truth, which is, in fact, uh, syncing those aerial images that I will show you in a second with uh, finds on the ground. Like, um, and, and what you see here is an instrument of uh, kind of what, what we call now, um, through uh, public lab, uh, community satellites, uh, which are balloons and kites uh, with cameras, uh, that, that survey uh, the area uh, and, uh, and uh, effectively um, allow a kind of a sinking of uh, the old uh, aerial images from the First World War with uh, what is located uh, on the ground. So here you would see, uh, f um, I, I have to really rush through those images, um, a, a photograph that I think is very important because it is taken by uh, some of the first aerial photographers. This is the uh, Bavarian uh, Flugbataillon 304, which was in Palestine at the time, fighting, flying for the Ottomans, recording uh, the, battle, the battlefield. Um, and again, we were looking and, and uh, accessing that archive in order to find not what it wants to show, but the kind of inadvertent signs that exist uh, within it. So zooming into very much uh, pulling in as much as you can, you can see here those uh, very typical uh, cirrus, those, those kind of circular stains that we've seen are very typical of, of Bedouin cultivation. Uh, farms, again, we are very much at the molecular level of the film right now. Um, in, in kind of picking up elements that need to be synced through uh, that kind of aerial uh, photography. Sorry, do, did you mean five minutes or was that cut? Maximum, okay. Um, in the Second World War, there has been another set of, uh, of very uh, important photographic survey um, that uh, I will not go into it now. But again, uh, the attempt is to go and find uh, things which are at the level of the grain uh, of the image here, a hole in the earth, which is a well uh, that has to be synced with uh, the things on the ground, uh, a house uh, with a house, and, and most importantly, and what uh, might now, through various international organizations, we are bringing that story to, uh, allowed to show that the cemetery has been there before the State of Israel. Now, if Israel ignores it, this is one thing, uh, but we need to find all sort of international leverage in order to claim for it. Um, they have read it out of the, of the aerial image. You, can th you, you know that in, in, uh, you say about colonial cartographers that they create white spots on the map, uh, and apparently aerial image is a kind of... Uh, uh, a neutral thing that just capture everything. However, you can read thing in and out of, uh, of an image, and in particular, uh, the graves are important. Um, those graves that would have existed at the time of that image uh, were made simply of piles of earth. The size of it is roughly the size of a single silver salt grain on the image. Uh, you need to understand two processes, two topographies, the topography of the film and, and the silver salt particles in it and, and what is happening on the ground. And when you pull into an area, uh, you see those, um, an area that is lighter than its surrounding, that, that, that shows you that people have walked in on which there is a more or less regular distribution of silver salt grain that um, uh, in fact is almost the only thing that could help um, uh, that uh, community kind of anchor its claim to uh, that piece of land. Thank you very much.
Okay. Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming. And thanks, of course, to Bernd and Stefan and their colleagues for making it possible for me to be here. Um, <clears throat> um, my talk, uh, <clears throat> of course, has some connections to what Al was talking about, though I will be much more speculative and probably uh, operating on, on, on grounds that are somewhat different if uh, um, if not larger in scale in, in, in some questions, but clearly Al was showing to us how the, <clears throat> the earth actually um, and the, the sky and the waters can be read for evidence of injustice between humans. I mean, in a way, this, you can also, what, what the climate scientists have also shown us, and environmentalists uh, agree, that you can read um, the, the earth and the waters and, and, uh, and buildings and all of those things for evidence of what to humans may look like injustice, not only between humans, but also between humans and non-humans. So, uh, for instance, of all the vertebrates that exist on the planet, humans and the animals they keep, either to eat or as pets or whatever, they consume, of all the vertebrates, 95% of what the vertebral world, world consumes, leaving only 5% for wild animals like elephants and cheetahs. And you could think of that as injustice. You could, so in a way, I'm kind of expanding the scale of this uh, question, partly to think about a problem that I want to begin with, which is really as to why even though we are <coughs> living through two um, sets of global problems or planet-wide problems, um, often uh, organized under the two rubrics of globalization and global warming, why global warming is a much less global question than um, globalization is. To, to, to give you an example of that is if I think about uh, which are the countries where scientists actually write general books as public intellectuals for their reading publics on the problem of climate change, you will find that they live either in Europe or in North America or in Australia uh, or in England in these places. So, I know about the country I'm from, India, where, which, is going to be, which is already being impacted on by climate change. There's no Indian scientists they, who actually write general books on climate change. They work on specific glaciers, they work with IPCC. So, and this is very different from globalization. Because if I think about books to read about globalization, I can think of many interesting books written in India for Indian reading publics by Indian economists and others on what globalization is. So globalization at many, as a problem, as Bernd was saying, I mean, today's terrorism is global, the financial markets are global, the refugee crisis is global. Um, you go into a, new, into a university or a college, you see that the students have become global, we talk about globalizing education. So globalization is a process that has percolated into our everyday experiences. Global warming is much more difficult to connect with everyday experience. So in a way, one reason I think is that globalization is a story that's told, that can be told ground up. You can, you can tell about particular governments and the liberalization of their economies. When did it happen? When did they make the decision? When did companies become multinational? When did the media become global? You can actually tell those stories from ground up. Global warming, on the other hand, was formulated as a problem from above. And basically, anthropogenic global warming, that formulation required American big science. Uh, it required huge investment in technology and for climate scientists to be able to develop 
models of what they call planetar planetary climate system. In other words, to have models that talked about not about climate of a region, the weather of a region, but actually climate of the planet as a whole. And this, <coughs> uh, even though some roots of the science go back to the 19th century and even earlier, um, but this really was uh, an outcome um, of the post-war period, the post-Second War period, and very much goes back to a theme that Eyal was uh, emphasizing, which is um, the theme of uh, weather and its military capabilities. That is the whole question of uh, militarization of space and weather. Now, and of course the nuclear fallout. So from the end of the Second World War, Americans were very interested, particularly the government, were very interested in studying the atmosphere. Um, American scientists would regularly advise uh, the American president uh, on the state of the atmosphere because of the nuclear fallout. Also because they were interested in, in, in space warfare and in this question of whether or not weather can actually be, could actually be weaponized. Could you create drought in the enemy's territory? Could you create floods in the enemy's territory without affecting your own, own, own uh, nation or your own territory? Those questions were of strategic importance, so the American government was adv advised by these atmospheric scientists, and it was at one such meeting in 1957 that Roger Revel, one of the early climate scientists in the late 20th century, made that famous statement, which has now become famous among climate scientists, where he actually said to the American president and the committee that humanity might be actually carrying out a grand experiment whose results were not known by uh, digging out of the earth uh, these fossil fuels that had been made over millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, and putting them out into the atmosphere, uh, the, the greenhouse gases, in such a short period. And that we often think of as one of the first statements uh, in the American context. But, but this question of whether or not space could be colonized and whether or not actually the other planets apart from Earth could be made inhabitable for humans is really what led to the setting up of um, Carl Sagan's unit in NASA. And you will remember that James Lovelock of the famous Gaia theory he comes and joins uh, Carl Sagan's unit in 1966. And the question before them was this question, whether or not Mars, for instance, could be made inhabitable for humans. So you could actually colonize Mars and carry on <coughs> warfare from that. That led to a question which is at the root of what became eventually Earth system science, which was, uh, why was the Earth inhabitable and so friendly to complex forms of life for more than 600 million years? You can see immediately the scale becoming wider. And why was Venus so hot and the Mars so dead and could Mars have had life in the past? So interestingly, the question that opened up for these people <coughs> in the 1960s was the question of life on a planet, history of life not human life, but how, how does life begin? And therefore, <clears throat> there are also two interesting issues why this became a question. <clears throat> so something they realized is that what makes this planet inhabitable is that oxygen has been maintained at 21% of the atmosphere for a very long time, for hundreds of millions of years, long before humans came. If the oxygen share went up, things would go up in flames. If the oxygen share went down, we would of course choke to death. Now the problem with oxygen is that it's a highly reactive gas. If you if oxygen doesn't live by itself, it quickly connects with something else to create oxides and things. So basically what it means is that the planet, if life has to exist on this planet, the planet has to find a way of constantly supplying fresh oxygen to the atmosphere and then maintain it at that level. Now, now we know that the phytoplanktons play this role. You know, they supply about 60% or 70% of the ox oxygen we need. Now, uh, a mathematical biologist has created a model saying that if the temperature of the seas went up by six degrees Celsius, then the phytoplanktons would die. 
and we wouldn't have enough oxygen to breathe in. But these sorts of questions made the issue of life, life in general, what I call the natural history of life, Aristotle's Zoe, uh, one of the most fundamental questions of uh, what would eventually become earth system science, which is the basis for what we today call climate science. So out of that realization that the planet actually has to do many things for life to subsist, survive here in spite of the five extinctions. Out of that initially came Lovelock's Gaia theory where basically the early model was almost a homeostatic model where he was saying that if it is true that life creates conditions for its own maintenance, then it might also be true that if humans get in the way, life would have a way of getting rid of us in order to continue itself. Now that Initial homeostatic model, as far as I can see, has not been accepted. But more research eventually showed that there are many interlocking systems and feedback loops, independent of human action, that actually have to create, that actually go into the creation of processes that ultimately support life. And the ultimate bedrock for the maintenance of life are neither humans, nor plants, nor fish, nor lions, it's bacteria, it's microbial life. So microbial life existed, was the only form of life for three billion years on this planet. And even today, <clears throat> I was just reading the other day, that if you take on the one side, if you could put on the one side all the microbial forms of life on this planet, and on the other side you put all the uh, men, whales, humans, birds, insects, um, uh, trees, all of those things, the biomass, the microbes first of all would outnumber us. And you know the total weight of microbes would also outweigh others. So that is one of the basic uh, fundamental bedrocks of life on this planet. And that eventually led to the development of a kind of interdisciplinary, uh, <clears throat> intersectional area of science, which today we call Earth System Science. And NASA set up its first committee of Earth System Science in 1983. So this would not have been possible without big science, without big technology, without satellite observation, without us being able to bore holes in the Arctic and dig out ice core, which are 800,000 years old. So this, it's big science that produced, and big science deeply rooted in the Cold War uh, competition for space and military competition about weaponizing space and weather, and deeply rooted in, in that kind of technology that eventually gave rise to this a conception of a planetary climate system. A planetary climate system is a construction of the scientists. In other words, it is something that you kind of construct after many observations. It's not something you bump into. You don't run into planetary climate system. Um, you don't, it's so mediated by the time it affects you. So if there's a flood or if there's a drought, there are so many factors that contribute to it that we still can't say that this drought or this flood is exclusively because of what's happening in the planetary climate system. And that's one problem of relating the local to the planetary. But on the other hand, what this big science has created, which is now doing, which big data is now doing with literature, with other kinds of things, big science creates what my friend uh, Timothy Morton called hyper objects. In other words, constructions that have an object-like impact on us, but that don't themselves exist in an object-like fashion. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so you could say that climate science literally came out of what I often call interplanetary studies. You know, James Lovelock, who eventually developed the Gaia theory, which was about this planet, came to NASA to study Mars. Because Mars was the problem case. Mars was what gave rise to what, this question, what is life? And in fact, 
initially, uh, there are all kinds of uh, studies that these NASA scientists were doing. One of the books they were reading to answer this question, what is life, was actually a series of lectures that Schrodinger, the physicist, gave in Dublin in 1939, called, you know, which was later published as a book called What is Life. So they had thermodynamic approaches to life, all kinds of approaches to life. And there was a very interesting debate between um, Lovelock and somebody else about how to, how to make Mars inhabitable. And Lovelock's answer was, make it inhabitable for microbes first. And they will make it inhabitable for others, which was kind of the lesson he was taking from studying this planet. So he came to study Earth from having studied Mars. And the godfather of modern American climate science, James Hansen, used to study Venus. And he used to wonder why the Venus was so hot if the Venus had seen runaway planetary warming. And when he thought Venus had, he was anxious or he was concerned to see the same processes were going on in this planet. So in his, in his book, he says, I just took a few months leave to look at our planet. And of course, that leave became the rest of his life because he realized that that was what was going on here when he reported to the White House. And the first President Bush is um, uh, famous or infamous for, for saying that he was going to deal with the greenhouse effect, with the White House effect. Um, but so, so climate science, therefore, was looking at this planet, and still does, from outside in, uh, as if you were on Mars. Uh, and you're looking at this at the Earth. So in effect, and you can see that this was actually the vision of the planet that came out of space science. If you remember, I don't have the slide with me, but if you remember this, that famous picture, 1968, called Earthrise, astronauts looking at Earthrise from the moon. And then a very famous marble-like picture called the Blue Marble of 1972. I mean, those were f pictures that actually embody and, and, and tell us about this human practice in which the scientists are doing through their scientific imagination of looking at this planet outside in. And it's only when you look at this planet outside in, what you begin to see is that you can't separate the question of humanity and the natural life of the human species from the larger story of life on this planet. Because everything we do, all our institutions of economy, of polity, of governance, are embedded in Earth processes that support life, not just our life, but all other forms of life. So in a way, if you, you can look at the climate problem, as many do with good reason, as a problem created by developed countries who have hogged the carbon space in the course of their industrialization and now left very little carbon space for China and India to occupy. So in effect, uh, particularly you know, the Indian position sometimes is it's our right to pollute now because you guys have done your pollution <laughs> and you've guys, you have done your pollution more than your actual share of the pollution, polluting. So you should, and that's the debate, IPCC uh, debate. And so on the one hand, IPCC is saying, we've got to finish doing our polluting, whatever polluting we have to do, let's say by uh, so many decades. And on that depends the chances of keeping uh, the climate change that's happening below the level of what's called dangerous, so 1.5 degree average rise or two degrees. Um, and Indians are saying, and the Chinese, I guess, are saying, and the poorer nations are saying, it's but we have to pollute, we need the right to pollute because uh, we have so many poor people to bring out of poverty. And there's a certain legitimacy to that argument, I'm not denying it. But on the other hand, the moment you step back and you take a grander history and you think of not just climate change, but you think of water scarcity, that's now a planet-wide problem. Um, you think of uh, population growth, that's a planet-wide problem. Uh, it, you begin to see uh, it has and population growth itself has many other effects in our life, mediated effects. You begin to see that, that you are not simply dealing with um, climate change as a particular problem of development. You're also probably dealing with a chapter in the history of a species called Homo sapiens, 
who have been, this species has been for quite some time uh, flourishing, it, kind of uh, flourishing at a rate that is not the rate of what you might call evolutionary uh, change. So, the, so if, you, if you, again, if you look into this planet from outside and look at the history of life, if you are able to see the history of life unfold before you like a film, then what you would see is that, you know, uh, this animal appears from the genus Homo, called Homo sapiens, that we call Homo sapiens, and then within a very short period of time, they become the top carnivores and become the most dominant species. They're everywhere on the planet and claim most of its resources. So an Israeli historian, uh, Noah Uval Harari, has a very interesting book called uh, Homo sapiens, A Brief History, where he argues, and many other people uh, also argue that, that if you look at the earliest stone tools that humans used, uh, that Homo sapiens used, so we're sort of going back you know, tens of thousands of years, not, not, uh, not sort of millions of years, you find that the earliest stone tools were used for breaking bones. Why were stone tools used for breaking bones? Because as he says, humans had to wait in order to eat dead animals. They had to wait until lions and hyenas and foxes had had their shares. So by the time the lions and hyenas and foxes had eaten all the flesh of the body of the animal, all you were left with were bones. So you could break bones in order to eat the marrow. So his argument is that, that you don't have to go very far back in evolutionary history to actually find that humans were in the middle of the food chain. Now, the second argument he makes is that if you look at other animals that actually rose to the top, became top carnivores or became the dominant species over evolutionary timescales, you'd find that the individual members of those species became majestic. You know, the, the megafauna we hear about. Or, and other animals adjusted. So it happens over millions of years. So he says, as, he has a very funny sentence where he says, as the lions uh, became better at hunting, uh, the deer became faster at running. And the rhinoceros became extremely more and more grumpy in order to fend the lions off. But whereas humans individually are tiny, but somehow we developed a big brain which allows us to create symbolic systems, create abstract thoughts, create abstract affiliations like tribe, nation, groups, whatever, international. So we learn to combine. And we are basically an animal that hunts in packs. And so we learn to combine. And, and it was our capacity to use these abstract thoughts it was our capacity to use this symbolic system that meant that we rose to the top of the food chart or food chain or the web of food so quickly in evolutionary terms that other ecosystems did not have the time to adjust our, our rise. So uh, if we had evolved to this state that we have now, then the fish would have evolved to learn ways of avoiding our deep sea trawlers. You know, we wouldn't have been able to hunt them out of existence. And now, of course, and then there are, you can ratchet this story up. So the first ratcheting, I would say, happens with the beginning of the Holocene and the invention of agriculture. The, then about 6,000 years ago, the seas, the oceans of this planet, settled down to the level where we find the seas now. So all the deltas we know, the rivers stabilized, the deltas stabilized, and humans began to form within a, within a thousand years of that happening. We began to form our first cities and our first uh, <coughs> uh, empires. Um, from there, the next ratcheting up was European expansion. And the next ratcheting up was industrialization, the finding of fossil fuels. And the next ratcheting up is what I'm going to show you some slides of the great acceleration graphs. So these are all from Earth scientists. By the way, you, you remember that when Paul Crutzen an, announced that we should call this new epoch, the new geological Anthropocene, he made it in the newsletter, in the newsletter of the Association of 
earth system scientist, the, the, who always connect geology and biology. So uh, basically very quickly, uh, these are very well-known graphs from Will Stephan and his colleagues. The, the dotted line is 1950. And basically it's connecting socioeconomic processes, so population, real GDP, I, I, you can probably read this. It's connecting that the next graph breaks it down, OECD, BRICS, and others. But look at the way uh, the planet has responded and what has happened to the planet. So you can see that everything goes up exponentially after 1950. And that's why they call it the Great Acceleration, and that's the last ratcheting up of this, of this event. So, in effect, um, talking, coming, bring it back to the question of the forum, let me make just two points to bring, bring it back to the question of the forum. So, I, I often say to my friends, don't get too moralistic about fossil fuels. I mean, we have overreached, that's true, but humans have never had it so good. I mean, in spite of all the inequalities, uh, it actually has allowed us to seek more and more justice for more humans. And in some ways, what has happened in human thinking over the last 200 years since the Enlightenment, I think, but particularly, of course, it's been, ha it's been helped by the coming of agriculture. Humans forgot over a long time that they're one animal among many. I think when humans were hunter-gatherers, if you read about the totemistic religion, you read about what Durkheim wrote about them, you will see it was impossible to forget that you were one animal amongst many. But if you, Kant has a wonderful essay, 1786, called A Speculative Beginning of Human History. And he reads the biblical story, the Genesis story, to make a distinction between what he calls the animal life of the human species and the moral life of the human species. And he says very clearly that the planet will take care of our animal life. We don't need to worry about animal life. The biologists, will, the sciences will study them. Where we are free is at our moral life. And that's where we can pursue perfection. And that breach between the two systems of knowledge is precisely what underlines the separation of the social sciences from the physical sciences in the 19th century and later. Heidegger's uh, and a whole stream of German thinkers, you know, not just Heidegger, but people influenced by him, Hannah Arendt, Karl Jaspers, um, Gadamer, and even Karl Schmidt. There's a long line of German thinking which is fearful of technology, which has looked at technology as the human overshoot. You know, the fear that technology will make the globe uniform, it'll make all cultures uniform, and uh, we're pretty overreaching. But I suggest you, if you go back and read Heidegger, we can talk about this a little more, Heidegger talks about Western philosophy forgetting the question of being. But within Heidegger's philosophy, there is what I would call the forgetting of the natural history of life. So when he, when he looks at the jug in that wonderful essay on what is the thing or what is the thing, uh, where he looks at the jug and he says the jug is about the emptiness that can contain and pour forth. And the jug brings nutrition from the earth to it to the vine and its fruit, there's no awareness that actually the roots of the vine work the soil. And the soil is actually also prepared by bacteria. So in the end, the clay that you make the jug with actually has the work of bacteria built into it. So I would argue that the, his the natural life actually is the precondition for the Heideggerian thing, for that emptiness, for humans to produce that emptiness in which he sees cultural life of pouring and, and receiving. Um, so therefore, to bring it back to the question of the forum then, here's the problem. The problem is that today our overshoot, what I'm calling an ecological overshoot of the part of humanity, is not just creating injustice between humans, it is. And I think EALS was a wonderful way of demonstrating you know, a great new research project. It's, it's actually, putting pressure on what I call the distribution of natural life on this planet. The distribution of natural life is the condition for life in general. Many biologists are beginning to say that we are already in the first phase of a possible sixth great extinction, which may happen in 300 years. If they are right, then the category Anthropocene, which is the name of an epoch, won't do. We might have to call it the Anthropozoic era or something. And therefore, the question of the forum 
is complicated by the fact that today we are not simply looking at inequity between human beings, which we have to look, address. What we don't know, and this is our predicament, we are also, we don't, don't know how to think about the non-human, both living and the non-living, and there's a connection between the two. Incidentally, the other thing that's forgotten in Heidegger in that sense, I'm not blaming Heidegger, I'm simply saying when I read him, you read Heidegger in the Anthropocene, what he wouldn't have known perhaps is that this planet is much more mineral rich because it has life on it compared to dead planets. Because life itself produces all kinds of oxidation and oxidizing processes, which actually leads to diversity of things, of basic non-human uh, inorganic life. So the problem then is how to compose what Latour calls the commons, how to bring all of this into one forum, as it were, and I think there's a predicament in our thinking because we are asking ourselves, our moral life, what Kant would have called the moral life of the species, to give us the resources with which to address the problems we have created in our animal life. You know, we are one species that's creating problems for other species. And to think that we can deal morally with a process of natural history of life, which is indifferent to human notions of justice or morality. There's natural selection even at the level of bacteria. And we, we might, animal rights people have discovered some ways of extending human moral sphere to include animals, some animals, not all. We don't know how to include bacteria and viruses and we particularly don't know how to be just to bacteria and viruses that want to kill us. And, uh, and there's a very interesting, I mean, they're not, they, you know, they're not necessarily designed to kill us, but we sometimes create conditions whereby they become, they can kill us. So for instance, excessive use of antibiotics has led to a natural selection of antibiotic resistance bacteria. So, so sometimes we ourselves create those conditions. So in a way, when you look at the planet from outside in, these questions come up for which I think human notions of politics and justice are not yet ready. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Eyal and Deepesh, for these uh, two incredible uh, presentations, um, which uh, opens up, so to say, the stage um, for a discussion where we know already at the beginning that we not will find a final answer to it. So I think we are, what I said at the beginning, in a situation of transformation where old uh, categories are not working anymore. And we are in a situation of search for new perspectives, new ways to deal with this situation. And the proposal to use the old concept of forum to address so to say, the different levels of politics uh, which are going on, and you, uh, both of uh, you were describing from uh, two different perspectives, um, I think uh, should be the guidance for, for the talk uh, we are uh, starting now. Um, and basically, uh, at the beginning, I mean, the challenge I think we are facing is on the one side to look at the problem from a settlement in uh, the Negev desert, and on the other side, looking from Mars, so to say, to the world, and to find the interface between the two approaches. And uh, to some extent, uh, when Eyal was talking about the negative situation, he at least indicated already that the issues in the negative are on the one side local, but they have quite a number of universal global implications. So, um, in the first round, uh, my, my question at the two of you would be, um, yeah, how to come closer from the Mars to the Negev and from the Negev to the Mars and what issues the forum has to tackle to tackle the complexities of politics be, behind that. 
for example, human rights politics vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the situation of the, of the nomads over there, which are, of course, uh, uh, um, universal kind of, of, of claims. So you have uh, a, a, uh, at hand an involvement of the both perspectives, how, how to deal with, with that in, in concrete forums, yep. how I, to make that concrete. Yeah. Can I quickly um, show one more slide as a way into that question and showing the limits, the, the limits you have when you look at the planet from outside in. So just uh, if I can quickly, I, I didn't show it, but <laughs> right. <laughs> there, yeah, uh, yes. that's the last slide I want to show. Now, uh, in this context, so you see, when you think of the planet as a scientist, and this is again something that Will Stefan and his colleagues, Earth, science, Earth system scientists, came up with. It's very well known, the so-called planetary boundaries that humans must not cross for their own good. You know, water use, land system change, fresh water, uh, biosphere integrity, etc. Now, the interesting thing is, and this is addressing your question. So, when you look at the planet from outside in, you think your addressee is all of humanity. So that's why scientists would say humans must not. But humans as such are not an operational unit. I mean, it's very hard for humanity to work as a single agent. It took so long to come to the Paris COP21 negotiations, and even with all its imperfections. But hum there's no humanity out there to address as an actional agent. And that, I think, is the fallacy of the scientists when they look from outside in. So that's why we need to do work on the ground, that the kind of work that Eyal and others are doing, in order to cre find that interface. So I'm showing this as a fallacious proposition where the addressee of the problem is something called humanity. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one, one could also frame the problem as when you address humanity as a problem and the uh, uh, life of humanity, the ongoing life of why should they care about the settlement in Negev? Right. And on the other side, the question is, why should the people in the Negev care about humanity when they face the problems? Yeah, I think that the, the, the question is very much one of composition. I, I, I don't think that... Of course, the, the starting point of an investigation enters through, you know, the sort of hundred-year-old graves in a particular in a particular site. But you need to start composing a case, and composing a case is a matter of navigation. And you need to navigate between the molecular consistency of silver salt to the long history of the movement of the threshold of the desert throughout the last millennia. And, and, and to see how, so the debate is not climate change, yes, no, to see how it interacts with other processes that are happening on the ground. What can we learn from it? So it, the idea is never to say, well, you, you're dealing with a small scale or with a large scale. The question is, what is the mechanism of navigation? How you're able to put Variable things, variable, you know, kind of the, the idea of looking at, at not only the grain of the silver salt on the, on the image, but the, the, the grain of wheat and its development and why grain of wheat have been the kind of the indicator of uh, settlements or not. How does that interact with all other things? Now, the, the problem is, and, and this is what I was trying to... Um, to show that when you build an argument like that, which goes across scales and across time, that simultaneously speaks about climate change and about the local, is that there is no place that can hear it. So I can go to the environmentalist, and they would like to understand only the kind of the, the climate change dimension of it and say, oh, well, you know, this is a local manifestation of it. I can speak to the human right people, or I don't know, the UN, uh, uh, indigenous right uh, uh, rapporteur, and they could look at, at, at one particular case. But the, the question is that the kind of research that we need to undertake now, at an era in which we need to factor climate change as a political force, amongst others, is that we need to compose and navigate. And, and, and that kind of case that you build 
has no forum to be heard. Right? We need, we, we're in a situation by which you can build a case, uh, your epistemology, your construction of knowledge around a particular site uh, simply does not resonate within e any, any one of the existing forms. So you go like, how do we recompose law? How do we recompose our notion of human rights, of climate change, in which it cannot do either this or that? deal, not deal with human justice, but deal with human justice together with, you know, species thinking, uh, etc. Not to bracket anything out of the question, but to compose. And, and that logic of composition needs to, I think, to prevail our thinking, uh, because otherwise it becomes this or that, big or small, natural species thinking or human justice. And I think this is, this is, uh, not, not, not within the kind of, uh, it's not helpful for the kind of problems that I'm dealing with. Well, no, I mean, I, I agree with Yal in the sense that this is, it's not either or. But at the same time, I actually think there are, the problem is that you have, everything requires time. So what you do on the ground, will it has the time of the court, the time it takes for an Israeli court to dispose of a case. It has the time it takes the researcher. It has the time that the community will give you. All those things are time frames that are built into the project, even with an open-endedness. Similarly, if you look at the IPCC reports, they're also giving us time windows. So the fifth report gives us something they call a carbon budget for the world. And clearly, if all the work we do on the ground eventually adds up, to the larger fact of our missing the carbon budget, which we may very well, then the chances of climate change not, rema not remaining, well, or going into the dangerous zone. I mean, again, you can debate about who defines dangerous, but the chances go up. And I think this is where I totally agree with Yal that it's not either or, but it also means that we don't always know how our ideas that get into trouble, so not just we get into trouble, ideas get into trouble and that are troubled by the kind of risk, how they're going to recompose, we don't know in advance. We might actually go through impasses sometimes. We might, these ideas might fail us. So for instance, human rights. Now, if you walk into this museum, the first thing you see is a quotation from Benjamin Franklin. And it talks about rights of man. From his time, he, he talks about the time when he thinks any philosopher should go into any country be able to claim the rights of man, not rights of other things, but rights of man. From there to the UN resolution on human rights after the war, we have come to a position where we think every human life has to be secured. We value it. If a government doesn't secure the lives of its citizens, like the Chinese famine after the Great Leap Forward, or India, where people die of hunger, we actually see it as a human rights crime. We can, you know, those, these are criminal acts, and rightly so. But you see, but we, 300 years of European thinking led us to that human rights resolution where we thought every human life was to be valued. And we still think that, and I think we should think that. But when we made that resolution, there were 300, you know, 3 billion humans on the planet. When, that, when you extend that resolution to secure the lives of seven or nine billion planet, humans, making, assuming that there's development, you know, that there's human, a lot of human justices have been made, they will still be making demands on the biosphere. And they would be putting even more pressure than three billion people have. Uh, again, I'm simply saying that maybe the situation actually is one where the very notion of rights of men <laughs> that Benjamin Franklin thought about. We may need to rethink those things. Now here I have to be very careful. I have to say, I'm not, I don't at all advocate any projects for population reduction because any project for population reduction is in effect an anti-poor proposal. I mean, that's what it means. And therefore, I would rather go along with the human rights idea and suffer the consequences at the moment, if you gave me a choice. But I'm also saying that, that you know, these are not God-given ideas. These are human-made ideas. And therefore, I'm hoping that humanity will be able to 
evolve other ideas. Maybe we'll need to come to a post-human rights. Um, but we're not there yet. But I, I think that, you know, I mean, with all the problems that human rights, the, the regime of human rights and organization of human rights uh, face right now, and, and the, the very problem of, of uh, reducing politics to human rights, I, you know, I think that it's, it's reductive to think, and I'm not saying that this is what has been proposed, that rights or human rights is a static category. Uh, it is a, a continuously expanding category. It starts perhaps with, you know, 500 years back with the rights to property, with the rights to some. Uh, and the idea of right is expanding. As, as it is expanding, it is morphing. Whatever enters into it morphs the notion of what constitutes justice, and what constitutes right. So if you say that there is a kind of a, a quest for equality that needs to breach the, the threshold between human and non-human, I would, I would agree immediately, uh, because that is uh, a kind of a, a trajectory of, of expansion of notions of right. On the other hand, I think we need to also think about it from, um, to invert it. Now, you, you referred to Yuval Noah Harari, and, I, and I, th there is a very interesting point that he makes when he speaks about uh, the transformation uh, of hunter-gatherer societies uh, to sedentary culture. And he said, in fact, uh, we always think about um, humans cultivating wheat and uh, domesticating wheat. In <coughs> fact, let's invert the question. Let's see how wheat domesticated us. How a, a rather insignificant plant that was growing always at the edges of various uh, bushes and, and forest areas, very marginal, uh, has taken control of humanity to an extent that it has domesticated it. Wheat needed uh, flat areas. Human made the, the area flat. It, wheat does not like stones. Human took the stones away. Wheat likes water. Human broke their back and, 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 and irrigated it. Wheat needed constant supervision. Humans built their cities next to those fields. Uh, to an extent that a very marginal uh, plant has in fact become the most populous uh, plant uh, that, that is now on, on, on the planet, right? I mean, there's most, the, the, the thing that is most cultivated. I, from biolo in biological term, wheat is much more successful than humans. Um, and, uh, and that is, you know, we, we, we can think about that. Okay, and but but if you see that, that you have to extend your notions uh, to the non-human, what does that mean uh, related to the concept of the forum? In which way could the non-human be represented or be, be present, have a voice in this kind of forum construction we are talking about? The, the question is what you, what you call a voice. And I think various species and various categories of things an organism speak, if you like, in different ways. Um, they, they register their senses, they register the kind of the, the, the politics that happens around them, and they participate in different ways. Um, the idea of kind of thinking of uh, very literally uh, about, uh, you know, kind of a forum in which, you know, man could speak to wheat and wheat could answer to a cat and a cat, you know, this is, it exists in, 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 a, in a sort of a comic way. Um, the idea is really to, in, to in, start in, understanding in interdependency. Sorry? I'm just saying that it also exists in ancient imaginations, not, in a, not just in a comic way. It's still a human genre, yeah. but I'm thinking of, you know, animal stories and other stories where they do speak in human voice, but yeah. not necessarily in a comic way. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But how would you reconstruct No, I'm, my problem is somewhat, I'm, I agree with Eyal in the, in what he said about the morphing of these ideas and actually so if I go back to the 70s, uh, the animal liberation movement, which is coterminous. See, the 70s are very interesting. Because 70s, see the, the, you see the Club of Rome report. Uh, Paul Ehrlich writes the book, much uh, uh, abused later, uh, uh, The Population Bomb. In the 70s, you also have animal liberationists. So Peter Singer is producing his work. And if you follow 
the animal liberationist as one way of extending the notion of human to other non-human things. And from Peter Singer to Martha Nussbaum's uh, book, uh, Spheres of Justice, um, there are two things. One is, you know, Nussbaum has a sentence which I actually told her, has troubled, it troubles me, where she says that one day, where there once was nature, there will be human justice. Something of that sort, I'm quoting from memory. So, it troubles me, I'll tell you why. And, but, but Peter Singer extends, and many people following him extends kind of quasi-humanness to animals, but with one very important proviso, which is what they call a sentience threshold. That in other words, it's not a species-oriented argument, it's an individual animal-oriented argument, the cruelty to animals, even though he begins actually by showing how many animals we consume, you know, absurdly high number. But the idea is that animals should be able to have enough sort of a psychological apparatus to be able to fear, anticipate, and fear its own death in the hands of someone. Now clearly, even in the animal world, that sets a line, so a rabbit doesn't get it, qualify, but a horse probably does, right? <clears throat> That's why I, I was talking about microbes. So when you read these philosophers, you see that these philosophers actually read philosophers like Aristotle and others who had never heard about ba bacteria and viruses. So the whole problem of justice, uh, being just to bacteria, to microbes, which as I was saying is the bedrock of life, and their biomass is much larger than all of us and forests put together. That is the bedrock of life and that belongs, if they were the sole inhabit, inhabitants of this planet for 3.5 billion years, just bacteria and, and these things, viruses, they've had a role in our evolution. And then it means that where we're intervening today is a kind of, is a process of flow of what I'm calling life, it's an inadequate category, we all know it, but you can't do biology without using the word, is a process that was going on long before humans came into the picture. And it's not, it's a completely amoral process. It's not looking to us and saying, give us justice. It's a process where there's competition and collaboration, natural selection, which even ob obtains amongst bacteria. It obtains amongst us. And we have, to me it seems, that what I take from Harari's argument is that the human overshoot over tens of thousands of years, culminating in the Great Acceleration, has meant that <clears throat> we have produced a crisis in the natural history of life, which may or may not lead to a sixth great extinction. That's one fear we have. So in a way, morally, we have become aware of the situation we have created. And we are exactly doing an exercise that Kant would have seen as perfectly human moral exercise, which is our using our capacity to imagine alternative lives for us, right? So when we think beyond capitalism, we think, we think towards how else could we live? How else might we have lived? How else could we form another society? So that's a completely human moral exercise, completely legitimate, that's what we do. And the trouble is, in my view, that's why I'm calling it a predicament. This is not to negate the value of what Yal and others are doing. I don't, I think it's very valuable. That's why I'm calling it a predicament of thinking. And we need to, take it to whatever is the forum we are trying to confuse, compose, is that we are trying to bring the resources of moral life, human moral life, to deal with a problem in the natural history of life that we have created. But it's a history that is, by its own constitution, is indifferent, amoral and indifferent to our notions of justice. And that I see as a predicament of thinking. But practically, I agree with Yal that we can only learn by erring. So we have to allow our thoughts to morph. That's why we have to allow the notion of human rights, one framed in a particular way, to morph. Mm -hmm. And there's this struggle to extend human or extend, create other sort of moral spheres. It's a, such a big struggle that, <clears throat> you know, Bruno Latour politics of nature, where he's trying to imagine this, composing the commons, what he calls, he ends up creating a huge number of acronyms that he has to then add to the book as a glossary because he's trying to imagine a world that we haven't seen and we're really finding it difficult to imagine it because we have benefited from other ways of imagining the world. So anyway, I'm just, so in a way, I'm pointing to a 
predicament, but a predicament is, should not be a conversation stopper. A predicament should be an incitement to open-ended action. In other words... Yeah. Um, no, no, I, I agree. But then on the other hand, we need to see the extent to which um, the non-human right movement, as Paulo Tavares and, and others <coughs> uh, are showing, is, is built out of the destruction, out of the ruins of... Um, the kind of the ethical composition of what human rights was. So for example, the uh, Ecuadorian and Bolivian constitution that gives uh, eff effectively ecosystems legal standing um, is based on a fiction, right? That, that somehow would say that bit of ecosystem, again, it's very hard to cut it out from, from its context, has could be a subject of law, it could be a person, a legal persona. Now, nobody thinks that this is a person, nobody thinks you can speak to it, nobody thinks that, you know, it suffers in the same way or it has a moral predicament in the same way. It's simply to say that we recompose our values out of the ruins uh, of what exists. So you would take a regime of human rights that has developed, you know, at, at the beginning of the Great Acceleration, there were other processes that were going in the 50s, no? Universal, universal jurisdiction, for example, that would compose uh, a world of triangulation in which the kind of the legal frame of each state is not the ultimate arbiter of what is happening within its territory, but could be used in order to connect various claims and kind of network the world in a different way. So, but, but, and, and, then, and then that structure really composed to initially to hunt Nazi perpetrators or to hunt bad South American dictators is now recomposed as, as, as an instrument to bring in claims of ecocide, uh, to deal with environmental issues. Again, it is out of the, out of the stuff that is being left. So, I, I, you know, I think this is the kind of work that we need to do. You take it, you recompose. Could, could, you like, uh, could you give an example how to recompose, so to say, in a forum, the situation that, uh, let's say, aspects of justice to the ecosystem is taken care of in the recomposition of the forum. Yeah, so for example, th th this is the issue of universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction is if you have a court in Spain, you can take, uh, you can bring charger, usually genocide charges against the perpetrator in Chile, in Argentina, uh, etc. cetera, from, from, uh, from Belgium to Israel, etc. cetera. All, all those kind of peer-to-peer um, uh, sort of uh, working between states rather than a kind of a centralized um, justice system like the ICC. Now that has be, is being used now to take, so genocide was that crime which appealed to the conscience of, of humankind to that extent that it could not be contained and judged within the, the single limit, single confine of a single state. Now. The, the attempt of many environmental activists is to say ecocide should take the place of genocide. And therefore, uh, for example, forest fires in uh, Indonesia could be actually dealt with uh, in 18 different countries uh, worldwide and network the kind of political activism in, in, in a similar way uh, that the kind of the Nazi hunters or the South American hunters were. I, I, I can say that I'm involved. Uh, forensic architecture started very much as a kind of uh, an organization that is dealing with uh, war crimes and human rights violations. We were doing prosecution. For more and more, the cases that we get are to do with this entanglement, with destruction of environments and uh, destruction of human communities. Uh, that, that, uh, that need to be thought together. Again, for me, it's a very practical question. I, a, working as, 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 a, as a legal activist, you, you never really understand the law as a perfect system. You use what you can. You make a bricolage, you compose it in order to bring the kind of the claim that, uh, that you make. It's a practical issue. 
Uh, but every practical question requires a different composition. So you need this, this, and that court uh, around the world to bring the human right claim and others to bring the ecocide claim because that has been legislated into their universal jurisdiction uh, clauses. And it's a kind of a tunneling warfare, if you like, no? or, or, or lawfare, the kind of the, the, the idea of conducting tactical conflict by using, uh, by using law or in, 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 in the way that you can. I, I have another example that I, I, I could bring in later, but um, maybe Depeche no, wants I mean, to. I just um, missing the, yeah, both, um, <coughs> I mean, I'm, I'm actually inspired by something he says, and I'll come to that, and I think, uh, I think that's something we are all doing, in effect, but also, again, I go back, going back to this chart, while there is no humanity that can respond to that call as humanity, as qua humanity, but the facts which, which allow scientists to create this kind of timetable for global action, which we probably won't be able to produce, those facts will have some consequences, which we have to accept. So that these, the, the working on the ground in that bricolor fashion that Yal was talking about, obviously will achieve some results, and some of them we may be able to scale up, some we may not be able to scale up, might be specific to situation, but going back to Yal's presentation and thinking back from Yal's presentation to what the subcommittee of the Commission of Stratos uh, 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 Stratigraphy uh, John Zalasiewicz subcommittee is doing, um, it sort of reminds, it all together comes to me at this, this message which I think is, Yal is giving and, and we're all, we all duty bound to do it, which is this. <coughs> Zalasiewicz has a book called The Goldilocks Planet, which he wrote before the subcommittee was set up. And he begins by saying, what would human footprint on the planet look like to a future geologist who may not be human, who may be a rodent, who maybe after we are gone, who will come and read the planet for the ruins we have caused? In effect, I think what we are doing today with the help of science, with the help of technology, with aerial photographs and everything, we are actually, it's not extending humanity in, the, in that right sense to everything else. But what I learned from what you're doing, which I find very inspiring, is that we are consciously calling on non-human witnesses. We are reading the earth, we are reading buildings, we are reading terraforming of the seabed, we are reading those agricultural settlements and their ruins. We are reading them to bear witness to what we're also doing. Mm -hmm. And I think we are in a phase of the entire project of renaming this geological epoch Anthropocene is in effect a proce process and a project of bearing witness. Because all the evidence they're collecting is actually bearing witness. It, it's really trying to bring their geological intelligence to bear witness to what we're doing. Trying to bring the biologist with intelligence to bear witness to what we're doing. And I think mm -hmm. Things will morph, something will mm -hmm. happen, but I think we are in the early moments of bearing witness. And in mm -hmm. that sense, we've expanded entities that we call witnesses. You know what, I, I think, I find it very interesting, but I think that there is a kind of an inversion of time that happens here. So, you know, you, you say, you know, when, when you look at um, something that happened in the past, say somebody, a building got destroyed, somebody got killed, or, um, another bad thing has happened. We can bear witness to something that has happened. The destruction is in the past. Now we have the traces of a destruction that is yet to come. The yeah. destruction has not yet taken place. Exactly. We are seeing the You're traces witnesses now. bearing the future. Yes, we're seeing the evidence now of something that has not yet yeah. happened. Um, of course, within that, uh, you know, there's many things that, that, that are taking place, but in relation to kind of to, to your discussion of climate change, yeah. the, um, the destruction is always yet to come. Yeah, well, and that's where I'm saying that in effect, it's not the animal liberationist project or the project of giving rights to somebody and particularly rights of representation. So when you think through received political science, so Steve van der Heiden, an American political scientist, has a very interesting book called Atmospheric Justice. Mm -hmm. And he's a Rawlsian. And he begins the book by acknowledging that the atmosphere is shared between humans 
mm -hmm. and non-humans. But then he says, but my theory has no way of dealing with the non-humans. So I will deal with the justice between humans. Right? So, and, and because he actually quotes another political scientist saying that if you give legislative rights of representation to non-humans, you will make them into permanent legislative minorities. Mm -hmm. Because they won't be able to vote according to their numbers. So in terms of received political theory, rights theory receives a jolt. But on the other hand, if you think that it's in the court of humans, humans are actually drawing on subjects like geology, biology, on subjects that are not human-centered. Yeah. So what happens, the social sciences from economics, everything is focused on human welfare, human justice. But now in extending the number of witnesses, you're calling on buildings, you're calling on earth, you're actually... On literature, on plants. You're, on you're, you're, you're drawing on chemistry, you're drawing on physics. You're actually drawing on subjects that are not anthropocentric. And I think that is a wonderful perspectival shift that's happening. As we gather these witnesses to what we're doing, our perspective is shifting. We're thinking mm -hmm. both anthropo of the anthropos and anthropocentrically, of human welfare, but we're also willy-nilly thinking non-anthropocentrically. And that is a beginning of the morphing that you're talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't know how the morphing will happen. Mm -hmm. But that is the composition of the, the forum mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. humans are listening. They're mm -hmm. reading other non-human entities to bear for the witness that mm -hmm. they bear mm -hmm. to what, what's happening. I want to bring uh, the focus on another important player in the forum. We didn't have in um, ancient Greece that is the role of the expert. Right. And we are speaking of different kind of exper expertise and experts. Um, <coughs> Deepesh, you were, uh, in your talk, you were uh, uh, referring to the, to the fact that climate uh, theory uh, was developed in a kind of Cold War situation by really a big uh, um, support by the U.S. government, uh, by big science in, in each way, uh, very much involvement by the military. Um, so that, that was one kind of creating expertise. And these experts play, of course, a major role in, uh, or experts coming out of this tradition, one has to say, play a major role in modeling climate change and so on. What EAL is doing, I mean, you also play kind of a role of an expert in, 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 the, in the situation. And uh, the way you described your practice uh, seems to me very interesting because on the one side, you seem just to be interested in solving a practical, political, social problem on the ground. But at the same time, when you speak about of composing the, the forum, mm -hmm. uh, what you do is you do epistemology, you do ontology, you create new kind of ontologies to get your points across. So you, you play a very specific expert role. So perhaps we can uh, yeah, sh uh, throw the light of the role of the experts because then also the question is what is the role of the kind of experts you were referring to, to societies, to communities, to individuals, and what is your role of expert in this kind of context? So to my, if I can uh, respond to that, so the person who actually helps me to think about that problem is uh, Jaspers. And particularly the books he wrote uh, when we faced the threat of a nuclear holocaust. Uh, a couple of books he wrote. And where he called something, in English translation, he called it the epochal consciousness. And, and his idea was this, that when we face a very common predicament, either in our thinking, the nuclear predicament was both in our thinking as well as in our practice, he, he said that, that in those moments we have to find people who will rise above what you would call specialized thinking, but in the English translation, it's called departmental thinking uh, of his books. So he, he thought politics as a departmental th thought, think way of thinking. He thought law as departmental thinking, science as departmental thinking. So basically, in effect, he was saying that when you have problems or a cluster of problems that impinge on so many aspects of our lives, it's, it is a generalist, somebody who brings it also the citizen 
almost has to become a generalist. So AR still needs the chemist who will supply uh, the technology or radiocarbon dating or other kinds of dating. It's not like we don't need the expertise, we will. But the overall formulation of the problem cannot be made by any expert alone, even including an ex somebody who's expert in politics. And therefore I find his resistance to departmental thinking a very useful mm -hmm. way of approaching today's problems. And which what, which what it tells me is that in the end our citizen, the education needs to change. We need to become generalists. We need the scientists explaining their science. We need Jim Hansen's, David Archer's and all these people. And we need to bring all that precisely into a situation where law is part of what AL is doing, politics is part of what AL is doing, but it is neither, a, it can't be reduced to just law, it can't be reduced to just mm. human rights, it can't be reduced to just mm. chemistry. Mm. Mm. And therefore, in the activity, whether of a group or of an individual, mm. the relevant mm. activity is a generalist activity mm. rather than mm. the specialist activity of an expert. And uh, so there's a, when you have interlocking problems, affecting our lives in different dimensions. Um, I think the value of being able to, being in that position where you not only call on the expert for help, but you actually have some understanding in the public sphere of that expertise, so that you know whom to call for help and what sort of help you need. I think that will also, again, eventually morph our idea of what politics is. You know, at the moment, r real politic and all of those things is very much the expert or consultants, you put them on certain committees, but you make policies which are geared to getting votes mm. in the next election in democracies, like mm. things like that. Mm. Mm. Whereas what I see in what you're doing is the ground for the beginning of another kind of political, mm. uh, which goes with the idea of composing, wanting to compose the forum constantly. Mm. You are just a citizen, or an expert, or an agent? Well, I think that um, the, the idea of, of a composition that comes from, uh, necessarily from a case, and the more specific the case is, the more um, it kind of, it, it requires and calls forth uh, the kind of uh, composition of various uh, frames and sciences, uh, etc., cetera, uh, that are necessary. So I'm not coming from any discipline, as an expert discipline. I'm not even, you know, for, for me, being an architect is being able to compose and put together. So if there is, the, the expertise is not in each one of the nodes, but in the kind of the form of, of assembly, in the architecture of the argument. And in a sense, the, the, it sort of expands the category of expertise because simultaneously, we have to understand Orientalist literature beyond its ideological critique. Right? There was somebody there in the desert in 1869, and that person has seen things through his ideology, but still he has seen things. So what has he seen, and how can I learn something about the, the environment in that particular issue, while simultaneously looking at goat shit at, and, and the kind of stains they make on the ground and the way that that stain is captured by a 1918, uh, you know, silver salt particle on gelatin on, you know, 15,000 feet above is, is another form of knowledge that has to work with it together with testimony of the people on the ground that has to be composed with a tax document, et cetera. I mean, I'm not saying anything new here, only to say that in, um, we're not police investigators, right? The, we are always, uh, wherever, and if we are confronting people, we are confronting the police uh, itself. We are counter forensic uh, people. So there, therefore, we are always in some kind of uh, predicament of epistemological inferiority to what the state could know. So they have the better optics, the most complete archives, uh, the scientists on hire. You know, we try to, to produce an investigation like that on 6,000 euros, right? Yes. Uh, because that's, this is what we have. So we need to be able to be better in, in, in composing things and in showing 
something that, that I think is very important in counter forensics, and that is the notion of dirty evidence. So whenever you, dirty evidence. Oh, yeah, right. And uh, dirty evidence is what a lawyer would tell me if, I, if, I'm, if I'm doing a prosecution file. He says, That's, this is dirty evidence, meaning it has things I do not need in order to make an argument, a kind of uh, a billiard uh, table logic of, you know, mechanical logic of causality. There's all this stuff there which we don't need. Just, just take it off uh, away. But what is dirt in one forum would be the operative information in another forum. And you need to keep that dirt on the, on the argument. You need to keep that excess uh, on, on that. And in, in that sense, you are never surrendering to the demand that each forum is placing on you, right? And, uh, a court, an international court, a UN commission, a truth commission, uh, a kind of an, an activist gathering, each one would like to say something else, and for it, perhaps in the activist gathering, the whole issue of climate change would be the dirty evidence on it. But you need to keep it, because that is what allows the, uh, the composition to travel from one form to the next. And I think that this is, this is something that is important. So again, uh, the kind of, if there is an expertise in a sense, it's the kind of dexterity within which you are able to maneuver continuously to, out, to try to outsmart. Many times we are being outsmarted, but um, um, to, to compose a logic that does not surrender neither to, you know, to the bad guys that we are confronting, nor to the demand of the forum, because none of those forums is a benevolent, neutral thing. Each one is conditioned. Each one is fucked up in another way. They're all uh, manipulated and skewed, and therefore you cannot give yourself fully to a forum. This is why I'm always very suspicious when we say, okay, let's compose this perfect forum in which human and non-humans I could go be absolutely kind of democratic thing. I know the minute something like that would be done, there is going to be somebody powerful who is going to manipulate it. Like the dreams of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, that kind of Kantian ideal that, you know, for kind of a universal uh, law is completely manipulated now and, and conditioned by geopolitical forces and become a court for Africa, effectively. I much rather move between imperfect forums uh, yes, and yes. use what I can uh, from those to make, to make a claim. I need to recompose the ruins and the imperfections of what you have rather than try to imagine a perfect thing um, and, and unify it. And then by unifying it, it becomes prey uh, to, the, to, to the biggest guy in class, basically. That, I mean, what I wanted to add to it very quickly is that, um, <clears throat> so at the moment, the kind of work that Yal is doing, it's happening in interstitial spaces. So the Israeli nation state exists, you know, other states exist. And of course that's where we are and that's why I think if you want to scale this up, you have to change the notion of what is politics. Mm -hmm. So Bruno Latour in his, uh, one of the last books, the uh, latest books in, on modes of existence, he keeps asking this very interesting and good question, when will economy meet ecology? Mm -hmm. And the question is very pertinent because economics and geology are of the same vintage as subjects they developed at the same time but never spoke to each other, you know. Uh, so economists simply, when you look at the price of oil, the price of oil includes the cost of extraction. But obviously, obviously the fossil fuel is free, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And, uh, and the thing is, if you took, look to established politicians and nation states, they're still talking development, they're still talking economy. You know, mm -hmm. in India it's sort of whether the growth is 4%, it should be 8%. And, and at this structure, and so on the one hand there's interstitial work, if you scale it up, the notion of politics has to change. But even in this imperfect world, I just want to mention that something very important happened when 200, about 200 nations got together in Paris last December. What, you know, even though there was no legally binding treaty, countries can default or renege on their commitments, America might have a president who doesn't, you know. So all those things can happen, but the fact is all these 196 nations opened themselves up for the first time on the climate question to peer pressure. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a very significant shift 
even if economy has not met ecology yet. That's a very significant. So, you know, in, in this imperfect world, I think, I'm just going to say, yeah, we, we yeah, won't yeah, do no, it no, one, uh, any uh, one timetable. Uh, actually, that would have been my last question. Uh, is there a kind of relationship between the idea of forum, as you address it in your practice, and the idea of forum, as one could see Copenhagen or, or Paris, right. and what would be the relationship? Uh, uh, evidently, they are working on different scales, but could one imagine a relationship at all? Or a relationship between what and what? Sorry. I mean, uh, 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 I mean, right from the beginning, we had this issue, how do you work with different scales? Mm -hmm. And of course, one could look at uh, the assemblage of, of uh, nation states in Paris or Copenhagen also as a kind of forum. Mm -hmm. the, the, the question would be, in which way could that, is or could that forum be related to the forum idea you have? Or you are yeah, I, I mean, of course, I, I'm looking at landscapes of imperfect fora. And as long as there are conflicts between people, between companies, between uh, whatever other groups, there would be tactical advantages within there. Okay. Now, yes, that, that is, uh, I, I would worry if there would be no conflict and will be under a single regime, under a single kind of uh, species equality that is governed in a particular way um, that is not allowing um, difference to enter into it. And of course, this is something that, that I learned from Deepesh in, in, in the, uh, the power of both a kind of a universalism of, of, of difference. But um, the idea of putting all our stakes in one form, in the COP, is, is, is insane. We need that for what it can achieve. And I agree with Deepesh, but then we need to snipe at it from another one. And we need to take those countries that have universal jurisdiction to do with ecocide and, and, and work in relation to what has been achieved uh, in COP on forest fires in the Amazon, on forest fires in, in Indonesia, on desertification, on displacement of indigenous communities along all these uh, areas because as, as, as very rightly so, the, 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 the lacuna of, of COP was that uh, you know, it did not take into account, or it did not take enough into account, the position of the indigenous people that were there, that were saying, we are the red line. You're speaking about economy of trade, here you take some carbon, you know, let me do my mission now and you later, etc. and all those kind of uh, treating of, uh, of that political issue uh, as if it is an economy, uh, whereas there was, um, uh, people that, that, that in fact, that means for them life and death. And uh, it is not a question of, there's some points where negotiation, where economy, when it meets the question of life, cannot become part of the economy. I do not believe, it, it's like Depeche is saying, you cannot treat, uh, although we would say economically, and for the survival of the planet, we need to reduce the population, right? That's a kind of an economical, uh, cost-benefit uh, arrangement, but Dipesh himself said, I would not accept it. There is a moral wrong. There's an absolute line that you cannot enter into it. There are things that are in excess of the economy, and we need to ask, what are those things that are in excess of the economy? And I think that life along those environmental thresholds, issues of ecocide, issues of genocide, issues of uh, destruction, uh, irrevocable destruction of the environment cannot be simply traded against other things. There are things that are outside uh, of the economy, and these are moral uh, lines. Of course they are. They have to be. But I do and want to say that if in the course, I mean, this is where we need to be prepared to take a risk. If in the course of doing all this, we miss the deadlines of IPCC, which we probably will, we'll end up with a world that is warmer, that has worse climate conditions, that will have more conflict, and we'll have to muddle through all that. I mean, that's... Uh, you know. Muddle yeah. through, that is the last word here <laughs> on the stage. We have the possibility of uh, taking th three questions by the audience. We can three Fragen from Publikum nehmen, sozusagen als Dankbarkeit, dass sie so lange ruhig waren.
Yeah, thank you uh, for two really original uh, lectures. So my question is, what is actually the role of the Bedouins in, uh, in Eyal Weizmann's um, uh, presentation? Because namely, I think that what we have seen is a certain uh, recognition of even the word human with a, cer a certain uh, progress. I mean, what you've said in the, in the second lecture is really uh, um, a, so, a historiography of sorts of uh, recognizing uh, the human in the presence with the development of civilization. And I'm sure that, you know, what uh, the, the, the kind of the, the subtext here is very clear, which is namely the concern that the way we practice um, post-colonialism uh, and the critique of, you know, the critique of colonialism, the critique of occupation, the way we practice it together with eco-criticism would kind of create uh, this category of humans, you know, the, the, Bedouin, the Bedouins, for instance, that are not quite a part of this uh, historiography of uh, humankind. Are, are there one or two other questions before we... Yeah, we take another one. Uh, my question is to both the panelists here. Uh, it's more than a question come comment. Really? Uh, I was trying to think in a bit different way. Where is... Yeah, I can't see the oh, question. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. In this way that, uh, yes, there are uh, other expressions of uh, bearing the witness that Dipesh was talking about. And when we look in terms of the theological writings particularly, uh, I mean, we can go back to Genesis, we can go back to the Epic of Gilgamesh and all. Uh, if we think the, the, social, uh, the, the contribution of sociology, particularly in the recent uh, 10 years or so, I'm trying to refer to the work of James C. E. Scott here, who has been doing work particularly uh, in the northeastern part of Arunachal Pradesh, extending to the highlands of Mongolia. And there is an uh, entire population, let's put it in that in quote, uh, which he terms as the people of Zomia. Mm -hmm. And in these relational terms, I don't know how the other panelists will respond to this. I don't know how we are trying to actually imagining forum because even to take the, the Arendian position or post Arendian position, a polis or a forum will always try to include whereas as far as my limited knowledge or understanding goes, people as subjects or pre-constituted subjects have always escaped the very establishment and they have always, always tried to be autonomous. In that lieu, how can a forum which always will try to include has a paradox of playing into, into the hands of a dystopic post-human reality which is facing us absolutely, but is it that we are creating a humanoid in itself is a object which is extracting the life and pushing it to that extent where we will be in that way an autonomous being which is I would say a missing being. Mm -hmm. Okay, already think two complex questions. Um, uh, maybe I, I, I pick up the question, a really excellent question about um, uh, the Bedouins, and uh, I know it's a bit unfair because you know now I can respond, and I don't know if I, if I, and, and you might not have the possibility to respond to that, so we can continue it later. I don't know if I, if I heard correctly um, the tone of that question, uh, or the assumption in it, as if. Um, the Bedouin life form in, at the threshold of the desert is at a kind of more primitive state to um, sedentary or urban life uh, within the area. And I think this, this is something I would contest, I think, and, and also to kind of to use James Scott is to say that um, those uh, forms of life that exist beyond the environmental thresholds are uh, in as much a consequence of imperial forms, of state forms, of colonialism, as the urban uh, life at the center. 
Uh, we are not speaking about different stages of development. We're simply speaking about uh, other modes uh, of life. And, and what is happening um, at the threshold of the desert is that in, in, in Palestine right now, is that communities want to go back to areas from which they were evicted uh, in 1948, between 1948 and 1952, 53, to a certain extent. Um, to, and, and, and the return is not articulated as a kind of a return in time. It's simply a matter of, of, of the right to, to, to land, to a kind of to property within it that is articulated in very modern way. I mean, the entire uh, uh, investigation that you've seen here was undertaken with the community of al Rakib. There is not a notion as if uh, looking at science, looking at aerial photography is the domain of, um, uh, of uh, the colonizer and, and not the work. I mean, aerial photography is there for, for and, and to interpret it, to read it is for all to use. There is not, I, 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 I do not see uh, these categories as, um, uh, you know, these are kind of, what, what you do, there is these technologies perhaps developed through, uh, uh, perhaps have military or uh, history like the internet has, but we use them because that is what is available to undertake our struggle. Um, but there is definitely not a division of uh, primitive and uh, a more uh, urbane kind of uh, uh, life within that. So, I mean, in response to both questions, what, what I learn from reading about climate change, its implications, the way it connects with biodiversity, question of life, natural history of life. So what I learn and what I've learned to do is to do two contradictory, uh, take, undertake two contrary moves, which I call zooming in and zooming out. So basically, if you don't zoom into the history mm -hmm. of humans in all its details, mm -hmm. you actually don't see human suffering. So if you looked at the, this planet from Mars, you actually don't see the suffering that humans inflict on one another. So the whole question of which people build a state so who sees like a state and who does not see like a state would be precisely questions of differentiations in that human history and you have to zoom in to see that. But at the same time, if you don't zoom out, you don't see how the planet is suffering. And that's why in the end I think zooming out is in a way not thinking like a human, if you, if you know what I mean. Or you know, looking at history of life, looking at the species, and as you know, in evolutionary terms, we come very late. Um, like if the, if the age of the planet is 100, we come when the planet is 80 because complex creatures like us can come later. And the fact is, when you zoom out, you see that both the rich and the poor of, of humans have actually benefited from the fossil fuel age. So the, the poor don't get much nutrition, but they live longer. And thanks to the use of fossil fuels in fertilizers, in irrigation, and even in antibiotics, in medicine, even in antibiotics. So, what ha so the average lifespan in Roman Empire was 20. And if you look at population growth and lifespan, you will see what has happened after 1950. In my lifetime, India, the last great famine India saw was 1943. After I was, when I was born, after independence and in my lifetime, we have not seen a famine of that order. And so when you, when you zoom out, you can see that we have flourished as a species. When you zoom in, you see the differences between us. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to do both. If you only do one, you will do so at your own peril, is what I learned from the literature. Yeah, thank you very much, Deepesh. Thank you very much, Eyal. And thanks a lot for coming. Thank you.